Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man with no plans and schemes, but plenty of hopes and dreams. Here is the captain. The problem with dreams is they come true. They don't come free. It's good to be seen. Good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. This week, we are very happy to be featuring a beer called Blarg. This is a collaboration beer from our longtime friends at Tactical Brewing Company. Blarg is a chocolate lava cake inspired imperial stout. Delicious. Blarg is boozy, creamy, and smooth with plenty of chocolate and vanilla. This beer is a dessert in a glass. Garage grade, four and a half bottle caps out of five. And let's give some praise and thank you to our good friends that helped us out with this week's beer run. First up, a big cheers to Amanda Jacobs in New Berlin, New York. And a big shout out to Charlene in Plainfield, Illinois. Thank you to everyone for helping us out with this week's beer fund. You can help us out by going to truecrimegarage.com and click on the donate button. Yeah, B W E double R U N beer run. Make sure you go to iTunes and give us a five-star review. It really helps the show. And make sure you tell a friend. And Colonel, that is enough of the business. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. On a warm evening in a tiny little Texas town, just a short distance from Fort Worth, three teenagers were getting ready to head out together for a night of fun. In fact, in some ways, it was likely to be a special night. It was a date night with a third wheel, but a welcomed one. 17-year-old Robert Brand was a good kid, and he had been granted the use of the family car. Brand's 15-year-old cousin Mark Dunman was in town, visiting from California. Robert Brand and Mark Dunman climbed into the Brand family Ford and headed off to pick up Brand's girlfriend, pretty 16-year-old Edna Sullivan. Edna was a smart and popular high schooler. All three of the teens were looking forward to a night together, a night out. After her parents approved, Edna rushed out the door when the two teens arrived to pick her up. The three were off to catch a movie at the local drive-in movie theater. The night was going well. After the movie, the weather was still great, and they still had some time until curfews. They decided to enjoy the comfortable summer night in each other's company a little longer before heading home. So they drove around briefly before parking the car at a local baseball field. The three teens got out of the Ford and decided they would hang out near the car and just shoot the breeze some more before taking Edna back for the night. If only the weather could have been less favorable that night. Maybe the teens would have went straight home after the movie. Had it rained, at least the three of them would not have been standing outside, leaning up against the Ford in full view of whoever or whatever passed by. Now, even though it was a Saturday night, this is a tiny Texas town, so any vehicles passing by would have been few and far between. In fact, the area was a bit of a ghost town that night, but only if those ghosts could talk. Maybe they could have warned the teens about what was about to happen. Across town, two men were cruising around in a two-door Dodge with the windows down. 
partly so they could enjoy the cool summer air, and for one of them, so he could have a clear, unobstructed view of the streets and the cars as they drove by, slowly, surveilling the area. The two men were dirty, brows and chest coated with dried, salty sweat from the day's labors. They had spent the day working in the hot summer sun, pouring concrete. The young man in the passenger seat was 18-year-old Roy Dale Green. Roy wanted to go home after working that day. After all, the day was long, the work was hard, and he was tired. But instead of going straight home, he was stuck riding shotgun with his boss's son nonetheless. His boss's son was Ken. Ken was two years older than Roy. Roy didn't care much for Ken. Roy was afraid of Ken. Ken was tall, large, and often during the work days, Ken liked to brag about having a criminal record. After cruising around a little longer, Roy was losing his patience, and he asked Ken, Where are we going? What are we doing out here? Ken turned and gave Roy a cold, dark look and said, I'm looking for a girl. Around 10 p.m., Ken spotted the three teens leaning up against the Ford near the baseball field. He drove closer and told Roy to be quiet. With the windows of the Dodge still in the down position, Ken slowed the car as they approached the ball field. He had his right hand on the steering wheel, his left arm hanging out of the driver's side window. When they got close to the Ford, Ken put his right foot gently on the brake pedal. His two-door Dodge muscle car, now creeping along at a near crawl. Ken wanted to really see the three teens. He wanted to observe them. He wanted to look at the girl. When he saw her, when he really saw her, he knew that was it. The beast inside of him was going to get her. Ken would have it no other way. Ken lifted his foot from the brake pedal, allowing the Dodge to continue on, first at the usual idling speed and then accelerating just enough to push the car down the lonely road at the normal speed. Ken parked his car about 150 yards down the road from the teenagers. Ken told Roy, He was going to rob the teens and have a little fun. Ken opened the car door. He leaned over and retrieved his 38 Colt revolver from the glove box. He looked at Roy and told him, When I get out of the car, you get in the driver's seat. Once I get up there to those kids, you pull the car up to me. Ken got out of the car and walked at a faster pace than normal. From this distance, Those three teenagers almost looked like tiny people. They grew a little taller with each step he took towards them. He had already made up his mind. Those little people were going to be his. When he was close enough, when he was close enough, he decided it was time to take control of those little people. He pulled out his gun, aimed it at the oldest boy, and told them, If you don't do what I say, I'll shoot and kill all of you. Ken demanded the keys to the victim's Ford. With Roy following in Ken's car, and with Ken's gun still on the three, Roy pulled up alongside of what Roy thought were robbery victims. Ken told the three teenagers to get in the trunk of the Brand family Ford. They complied. Ken drove the victim's car along a highway. Roy once again followed behind. Ken came to a field and parked in the field. Roy parked nearby. Ken got out of the car and walked to the rear of the vehicle. He opened up the trunk and then at gunpoint, he ordered 16-year-old Edna Sullivan out of the trunk of the Ford. Ken then instructed Roy to put her into the trunk of his Dodge. With Edna secured in the closed trunk of the Dodge and with the two male teens still in the trunk of the Ford huddled together, 
Ken said he would have to knock them off. Robert Brand and Mark Dunman begged for their lives. Ken ignored their cries and fired six shots, unloading all of the bullets from the cylinder of his revolver into the trunk of the car, killing both of the teenage boys that he had placed there. They left the vehicle parked right there on that isolated country road. Ken got back into his vehicle. Once again, he was behind the wheel. Roy took to the passenger side. The girl was still in the trunk. They drove off to another location. This new spot was just as secluded as the field where Ken had executed the boys. After assaulting the girl, Ken used a three-foot-long piece of a broomstick from his car to take her life. That night, Roy, and unfortunately those three kids, learned what real evil was. Ken was a classic case of real, true, pure evil. Kenneth Allen McDuff was six foot four inches tall, 20 years old, and mean as hell. He had already killed three people that we know of. When he was a kid, they called him a bully. When he was 18, they called him the bad boy from Rosebud. When he killed, they called him the broomstick killer. And when he killed again, they called him Monster. This is True Crime Garage. This brings us to the following morning, when some fishermen made a horrific discovery. Now, we should set the table first by stating that Robert Brand's parents were wondering what was going on. Heck, they were probably discussing what kind of punishment to hand out. As we know from the terrible events of the previous night, Robert Brand and his cousin, Mark Dunman, did not come home. Edna's parents had no clue what was going on. They weren't worried at all. This is because when they woke up that Sunday morning, they were completely unaware that their daughter was missing. This is because Edna, while she left their house Saturday late afternoon, early evening to go on her date. However, this was supposed to be a double date. Rhonda Chamberlain was a close friend of Edna's. Rhonda was supposed to go on the date with Edna. So Edna and Robert were a couple and Rhonda had been on at least one, maybe two dates with Robert's cousin, Mark, before the night that the three youths were killed. So after Robert and Mark picked up Edna, they went to Rhonda's house to pick her up. Edna was going to stay over at Rhonda's house after the double date, but when they got to Rhonda's house, they learned that she was not feeling well. So the three went out without her. Edna still planned to stay at Rhonda's, but this is a time when we weren't all in constant communication with one another. So when Edna did not return to Rhonda's house that night, she just thought that Edna decided to go home. Edna's parents thought that she was at Rhonda's house and they didn't know that Edna was missing until Rhonda calls them the next morning looking for her friend. It's crazy to think about how things could have been much different if Rhonda would have went along with the friends. Rhonda could have been killed as well, or possibly a group of four instead of three. Maybe they're never attacked in the first place. I think this monster was going to do what he was going to do, no matter how many people were there. That's the thing with somebody like McDuff. I think that if it wasn't going to be these three youths or... Edna and Rhonda or whomever, I think he had made up his mind that he was going to abduct, rape, and kill someone. I think he was going to find a victim no matter what that night. And unfortunately, these are the three that he found. Well, it's very strange too, because a lot of these killers, they 
take their time and they roam by themselves, not with the individual in their car. And then on top of that, they look for one individual, one vulnerable individual. It's almost like this guy wanted a challenge. Yes, I. it's hard to say. It's one of those situations, too, where it may have been slim pickings for somebody that's out there looking for such a victim. Right. But you're right. It's weird that he chose to have a partner or an accomplice that night. Before we get too far into the weeds, let's continue on with, with our timeline here, Captain. So the fishermen found the Brand family Ford the next morning at daybreak, very early. The vehicle was found just off of the road in that field where the two boys were killed. This is right where Kenneth McDuff and Roy Green had left the vehicle. The two teenage boys still in the trunk of the car. The killers still unknown to the police at this time. And for whatever reason, They had used Edna's mascara to write her name on the back window of the vehicle. From my understanding, they had taken this vehicle, Captain, and tried to wedge it up against a fence. I believe the reason that they attempted to do this is because with the bodies in the trunk and the way that the bodies were, without getting too far into these horrific descriptions, they were not able to close the trunk completely. And so they decided to back it up and wedge it up against a fence, hoping to conceal the horrific scene in some form or fashion. But we now know that clearly didn't work as, as soon as the sun comes up, this vehicle is spotted. But what a horrific scene. This is something you'd find in a horror movie. So of course the County Sheriff's department was called and out they came to the death car in the field. Investigators found Edna's white straw purse in the back seat of the vehicle. Robert Brand's parents were notified immediately. They were told that sheriffs found the two boys shot to death in the trunk of the car. They had located some of the girl's personal belongings, but they could not find the girl, and they didn't really know where to look. Of course, Robert's parents were asked if anyone else would have been out with their son, his cousin, and a girlfriend that night. This led the sheriff's detectives to Rhonda, the girl that, the teenage girl that by some stroke of some really good luck was not with the three teens that were killed that night. She tells authorities that she was supposed to have gone with the three that night and that no one else was planning on going. In fact, she told the detectives that Edna told Rhonda she would be at her house no later than 11.30 p.m. the night before. And when she didn't arrive, she thought that her friend had changed her mind and just went back to her own house after the date. The sheriff now had the terrible job of telling Edna's parents what was going on. Between the sheriff's department and Edna's family, neither were very hopeful. The vibe I got, Captain, when reviewing comments, it looks like they were all but convinced that they were looking for a body at this point. This case, of course, is all kinds of horrible, but for the detectives and the sheriff in charge, they are about to get a break in their case, a break of the biggest kind. Now, our two killers are not in the immediate area at all. In fact, they are near Marlin, Texas. So they are in another county from where they left the boys' bodies in the car. In fact, they are about two hours south of where the murders took place. We have a pretty definitive timeline here for the event, so let's go through that and see how this all plays out here, Captain. So Kenneth McDuff and Roy Green spot the three teenagers a little after 10 p.m. As we already said, the boys were killed a short time after that. Then McDuff and Green take the girl in McDuff's car about half of a mile north of where they left the boys. Sadly, and sparing the horrific details, Edna was killed there a short time later. After she was killed, McDuff and Green took the body, carrying her further from the road. They were looking for a fast way to conceal the body. 
They threw the body over a fence. They hopped the fence and then dragged the body, leaving it behind some bushes. After they concealed the body, they decided that it was time to get out of there. They have a considerable drive to make. They're going to drive McDuff's Dodge back to Roy Green's apartment, which is near Marlin, Texas. During the early portion of the drive, McDuff discards the broomstick and spent shell casings from his revolver. He does this simply by tossing them out of his window, throwing the items at random spots along the roadside. This to me, Captain, is always interesting when we get details like this because we see how often these types of criminals, these types of killers, they truly mimic one another, either knowingly or unknowingly. There's at least a dozen killers that we've talked about that when asked how they got rid of the evidence or concealed the evidence so well, they're nonchalant about it. They're like, yeah, I just tossed it out the car window as I was driving away from the scene. Well, they dis guard their victims as trash so they're disregarding the evidence as trash as well now also on the way home they stop off and purchased coca-cola from a hillsborough gas station at this same gas station both mcduff and green disposed of some of their bloody clothing then they arrive at roy green's place and they spend the night there now we mentioned that mcduff liked to brag to roy at work about his criminal record Yeah, because he's a piece of shit. Roy believed that most of it, if not all of these evil deeds that McDuff claimed to have committed were simply, as the kids say, bull pucky. I wonder what Roy was thinking now after these murders. Yeah, because this is evidence that this guy, he's been telling you he's a piece of shit. He's telling you he does shitty things. And now he's proved to you that he is a monster. After killing edna on the drive back and while they're trying to go to sleep that night so mcduff is saying some real scary shit to roy in fact he told him that even before the hell of this night that he had already raped and killed two women he's also coaching roy on what to say and what to do should roy get questioned by police about the events of that night this guy's a real turd sniffer he's telling him things like you just want to say nothing at all don't don't say anything at all when they try to press you for answers when they keep asking you questions get an attorney he even says when they start to beat on you we got to keep in mind this is texas in the 60s well sounds like a real party when they start to beat on you just keep your mouth shut because whatever you get afterwards you know whatever you get from being found guilty or being put in prison will be a lot worse done to you than what the cops will do to you so just keep your mouth shut get an attorney we didn't see each other tonight he also says and this is unfortunately one of the more famous quotes from kenneth mcduff but he tells roy dale green Killing a woman is like killing a chicken. They both squawk. Well, this guy's all kinds of levels crazy and all kinds of levels demented. At this time, Kenneth McDuff is 20 years old. What I'm seeing here, Captain, is, look, we we, we need to be perfectly honest here. Roy Dale Green, terrible dude. He was involved in this stuff with McDuff. He was his accomplice. But what we're seeing, what I see here is two very different sets of actions and behaviors by these two people that committed these crimes together. One, we have McDuff, who appears to be the, the, the leader, the driving force between the two. He says he wanted to find a girl. He's the one that puts them in the position to be out looking for victims. And all along, he's not only steering the ship, but he seems to know what the hell he's doing. He seems to be concealing evidence and instructing Roy what to do if he's spoken to by the police or interviewed by detectives. So, Well, one could argue that this was going to happen whether Roy was with him or not. Exactly. And I feel like we're talking about a situation here, Captain, where either 
Kenneth McDuff has done this before, so he knows what he's doing, or he's put a whole hell of a lot of thought into it and planned a lot of this stuff in advance. And now he's carrying out those plans this night. And as we will see the following day as well. Well, and like you said, he is the definition of a monster. The three youths were killed late Saturday night. The following day, the death car and the bodies of Robert and Mark are found that morning. We already said that the girl's purse was found and its contents emptied out into the vehicle. Now, authorities also recovered the boys' wallets. These were found in the car as well, both emptied out. But the sheriff and his men, they have no clue. They they have no idea Sunday morning where 16-year-old Edna is. We are back. Cheers, mates, to the people in the front and the people in the back and to Colonel. Cheers. Cheers. He's back. I'm back. Don't ask us what our middle names are. (laughs) You're strange. So that same morning, we're about 100 miles away. We have Kenneth McDuff. He wakes up at his co-worker slash his accomplice to a triple homicides apartment, Roy Dale Green. Now, for McDuff, this looks like it's just truly just another day for this guy. But for his accomplice, Roy Green, if he managed to get any sleep at all, I I would be surprised. But for him, Roy, he woke up in a nightmare. He quickly found himself in a mental hell full of emotional turmoil. Well, he deserves it. McDuff tells Green that they are going to bury McDuff's revolver beside Green's garage. And they do. How convenient for Green that they're going to put the murder weapon of two individuals right there next to his his house or his apartment. Then the two of them drive the Dodge to the home of a mutual friend. So this guy's name is Richard Boyd. Boyd is actually the one who introduced Roy Green to Kenneth McDuff only about a month prior to the murders. Now, it's really hard to say for certain, but I don't think that Boyd was made aware of what his two friends had done the night before, or at least not at this point in our timeline. But Boyd allowed McDuff to wash and scrub clean his car at his home that day. Now, Boyd, these are still relatively young dudes, right? McDuff is 20 And Roy Green is only 18 at this time. I don't know how old Boyd is, but Boyd still lives with his parents. So we could assume similar age as the other two guys. By this time of of the day on Sunday, with the discoveries of the boys' bodies in the car earlier that morning, the story is all over the news by the middle of the day there in Texas. Then once Kenneth McDuff is gone, once he leaves Boyd's home, Roy Dale Green, the accomplice, he hears the news of the two boys being found in the trunk of Robert Brand's parents' car on the radio. And he breaks down and starts crying. So then Green, he then confesses about the murders to Richard Boyd's parents. Boyd's parents tell... Green's mother, what Roy Green said that he and Kenneth McDuff had done the night before. Green's mother then convinces Roy Green that he needs to turn himself in. So on that Sunday, the searches for Edna, the missing girl, they lasted all day. However, they came up with nothing. They couldn't find her. But that was all about to change because Roy Green came clean to the sheriff. 
and he told him what he did. Yeah, so we actually have Roy Green's statement that he gave to detectives on that Sunday. Yes, this is Roy Green. It's his writing. It's him speaking, if you will, here. He says, we rode around the baseball park and wound up on a gravel road. McDuff, and often he just says he when referring to McDuff, he saw a car parked there and we stopped about 150 yards in front of it. He got his gun and told me to get out. I thought it all was a joke. I just didn't believe what he said was going to happen. I went halfway to the car with him and he went on. He told the kids in the car to get out or he would shoot them. I went up there and he had put them in the trunk of their car. He drove his car back to their car and he told me to get in his car and follow him. I did. And we drove for a while across the highway we had come in on and he pulled into a field. I followed and he said that the field wouldn't do. So we backed up and went to another field. He got out and told the girl to get out. He told me to put her in the trunk of his car. I opened the trunk and she climbed in. It was then that he said that we couldn't leave any witnesses or something like that. He said, I'm going to have to knock them off or something like that. I got really scared. I still thought he was joking, but I wasn't sure. They were on their knees begging him not to shoot them. They said, we're not going to tell anybody. I turned towards him and he stuck the gun into the trunk where the boys were and started shooting. I saw the fire come out of the gun on the first shot. I covered my ears and looked away. He shot six times. He shot one twice in the head and shot the other boy four times in the head. A bullet went through the boy's arm as he tried to stop the fire. He tried to close the trunk, but it wouldn't close. He then told me to back up his car. By that time, I was almost dying of fright, and I did what he said. He got in the boy's car and backed it into a fence, and he got out and told me to help him wipe off the fingerprints. I wasn't going to argue with him. I was expecting to be next, so I helped him. What a situation to be in. Like he said, if he's telling the truth, at some point he just thinks that this is all just a joke and that nobody's this crazy and nobody is this monstrous and nobody's going to just kill these two guys just so he can get to this girl. Well, and I said earlier, I would be surprised if he got any sleep at all. Kenneth McDuff is there at his apartment with him that night after these murders. And in fact, in his statement, he goes on to explain what happened after they killed the boys. But we don't need to tell every story or every part of the story. We'll, we'll spare everyone the details of what happened after that, simply to uh, show a little bit of respect to, to our female victim here. But you can see in his statement, like you said, Captain, if Roy Green is telling the truth there, he goes very quickly from believing, A, this is a game, A, this is a joke, this large jerk that I have to hang out with for work. Uh, he's just making all this stuff up. He's trying to be some time, some kind of tough, weird guy, uh, to Roy green, believing that Kenneth McDuff was going to kill him as well. And right. his statements were that, you know, I was nearly frightened to death by that time. He tells me we can't leave any witnesses or something like that. He's probably sitting there thinking, holy shit, I'm a witness as well. Even though I was riding shotgun in McDuff's car, I technically am a witness here. And so, of course, Green, once he turns himself in, he's going to be asked by reporters, you know, why did you turn yourself in? And he says that he he just couldn't stop thinking about what he had witnessed and what he was a part of and even the things that he had done the night before. He said that, I quote, I could not live with myself. I didn't want it on my mind. He was saying things like every time I close my eyes, I was seeing events from the night before. And he even said that he was hearing the haunting moans of the two boys. Like he couldn't quit hearing that. And so unfortunately he did not do the right thing on that Saturday night 
But he does the right thing on that Sunday and turns himself in after being counseled to do so by his parents, his mother, and uh, Boyd's parents as well. But question for you, what, what is the right thing at the, in that moment? He just killed two guys in front of you that he says are witnesses, like you say. In his mind, if he thinks he's a witness, then everything that he's doing is just self preservation at that point it is with the exception of some of the things that took place afterwards when they moved edna to another location um he, he's right. he's got blood on his hands and that's the about the most polite way that i can put it um you know edna wasn't unfortunately and this sounds weird to say unfortunately edna was not shot like the boys were she right. had a much slower lengthier death and McDuff used a broomstick to not just choke her with it, essentially crush her, her neck, her throat, you know, whether green was did it out of being terrified or what have you, he was part of that. He was there for that. He helped control this young girl all the while. And, and you're right, captain. It's, it's, it's easy for her for dumb garage guy here that's sitting in the air conditioning with a, with a cold beer in the, in, in the comfort of our own garage to, to, to sit up on Mount Pius here and say, what is the right thing and what is the wrong thing? And none of us really know what to do, how the hell any of, I, I just telling the story to, to, I can understand Roy Green's terror because just telling the story makes the hair stand up on, on my arms. And so I can, I get it that he says that he's, he's terrified. Hell, I'm a little scared telling the story here myself, but it's, it's one of those things that you just, if I'm in the situation, hell yeah, I'm terrified. Hell yeah. I'm scared. And yeah, you're right. It it, it becomes self-preservation at some point, I guess in hindsight, looking back on it, what you say here is if there's any opportunity to get your hands on that gun, that's the right thing. That's the right thing to do. If you right. have an opportunity to get your hands on that gun, that's the right thing to do. Now, we've referenced a little bit Kenneth McDuff's size, but you know, 18 to 20 dudes that are a little older can be a little intimidating. Kenneth McDuff is in, intimidating by nature, not just by his size, but by his actions, the way that he speaks. And he's he's very... He's very cold and very rugged and he's six foot four, about 200 pounds. He was a little thin at this point, but you take a look at a picture of Roy green and Roy green looks like a boy. I mean, I know that he's 18 years old, but he looks like he was about 15 in the pictures that I've seen and he's rail thin. So gun or no gun. We'll try to put some of those pictures up on Instagram, but I would argue, first of all, you're a piece of shit for hanging out with somebody that you think is a piece of shit. If you think this guy is dangerous, you don't like this guy, you shouldn't be hanging out with him in the first place. But then you get into this odd situation where, yeah, if you can get a hold of that gun, that maybe you can control the situation, maybe you can kill this guy. But if not, if this guy kills you, if you if you act up and he gets nervous that you are now just going to be another eyewitness, if, if he kills you, this becomes a quadruple homicide. And I don't know if this case gets solved at that point. Your only hope for solving this case is connecting Kenneth McDuff to Roy green, because there is a connection there. There's no connection between Kenneth McDuff, Roy green, and the three teens that were killed. And, and green, you know, he, he worked with McDuff. He, they were coworkers. So, and they had worked all day that day together in that area. And it was after a couple beers after work that McDuff decided he wanted to find a girl, as he said. And so I don't know how much we would say that Roy green was hanging out with McDuff. I get, I get more of the impression of like, this is a guy that I work with. He's kind of my boss because th- his father owns the company that that I work for. A- and I feel like this is a dude that 
he had to be around Kenneth McDuff and probably didn't like him and thought that a lot of what this guy said was was complete hogwash, uh, you know, bragging about right. being some kind of, of criminal. But so some reports here, Captain, say that Kenneth McDuff was arrested Sunday night. Others, other reports say that he was arrested sometime on Monday. So I'm not certain which one is factually true. Either way, arresting Kenneth McDuff is a much different operation than arresting Roy Green. Green turned himself in going not only along willingly, but telling investigators everything he knew about the crimes and the evidence. With Kenneth McDuff, it's a whole different situation. They they're trying to find him. They're trying to locate him because they get his name and in, in some of his information from Roy green, but this dude's already committed a whole bunch of crimes, a lot of kind of petty crimes in the area. So this is a guy that is well known to the local authorities. He's well known to the sheriff. Yeah. He's what I like to call a local known bag of shit. I think we need to dig into something here. You know, who is Kenneth McDuff leading up to this? And we hinted around about his troubles with the law in the trailer a bit, but this is a guy that the authorities in the area, the sheriff and his department were well aware of Kenneth McDuff and his family. So Kenneth McDuff grew up in the tiny town of Rosebud, Texas. Back in the late sixties, the town was so small that it was often referred to as a one-horse town. The most recent, the 2020 census, shows just over 1,200 residents. Like most Texas towns, on your list of notable people, one may expect to find someone of notable football fame. So even in this tiny town, Rosebud has three. One successful collegiate football coach, and two NFL players, one of which is legendary Hall of Famer Ladanian Tomlinson. But it's a short list of people, which makes sense with a small population, but the list of notable persons from Rosebud is just four names long. Three of the men of football excellence, and the other, unfortunately, is Kenneth McDuff. Next to his name, it says the broomstick killer a serial killer responsible for the deaths of 9 to 14 people, a man who reshaped the criminal justice system in Texas. Well, let's dive more into his background and history. Kenneth's mother, Addie, was locally called the pistol pack and mama because she was known to regularly carry a, carry a gun and had a reputation for pulling a gun on people in town. She says she carried the gun because Rosebud was a rough place back then. Rosebud was likely a rough place because of her sons, Lonnie and Kenneth. The McDuffs had four kids total, two girls and two sons. Kenneth was the youngest of the four. Now in school, Kenneth was known to be intelligent, a loner, and a bully. Well, that's commonly known as the smart-ass jackass. He did not finish high school, and he started to break the law when he was about 16 years old. Later, the Falls County Sheriff would tell people that Kenneth and his older brother Lonnie were two of the roughest hoodlums Falls County, Texas had back in the 60s. And we're talking about this. He's he's talking about them before these murders. Now, Kenneth's father owns a successful concrete business, the one that we mentioned that Roy Green was working for. Kenneth's mother owned a laundromat. So while they are a successful family, they are plenty rough around the edges, if you will. If you want to talk about obvious murderous tendencies, signs of a future serial killer, here's one for you. As a boy, Kenneth McDuff in his spare time would walk around with a 22 caliber gun and was known around town for shooting and killing small animals and birds. So to be perfectly clear here, he's not hunting in the sense that one would go out and hunt for sport, say like a, a deer hunter. 
No, he's just walking around right. with a 22. And if he sees an animal or a bird, he's likely to shoot it just for his own amusement. That's because he's a freaking barbaric psychopath. Now, one major issue, Captain, in my humble garage opinion here is that Kenneth and his brother Lonnie were, it looks like they were allowed to pretty much do what they wanted to with little to no consequences. And this is because largely in part of their mother, Addie, their mother considered her two sons to be perfect little angels. While, as we mentioned, the sheriff and the deputies referred to Kenneth and Lonnie as two of the roughest hoodlums and hooligans in town. So quite a contrast in opinions there, I should say. Well, what's crazy here is that you'd think that he'd have some respect. He has a strong-minded, strong-willed mother, and he has two siblings, two sisters. And I don't know, you'd think he'd have some kind of natural respect for women. So Kenneth starts to get into trouble around the age of 16. At some point, he drops out of high school. His official criminal re- record began two years before these murders. In 1964, at age 18, McDuff was convicted of 12 counts of burglary and attempted burglary in three different Texas counties. So Falls County, Bell County, and Millam County. He was sentenced to 12 four-year prison terms, which would have been great because then he would have been locked up instead of being out in 66 committing these murders. But the terms, the prison terms, were to be served concurrently. So you're not getting 12 four-year prison terms. You're basically getting one. You're serving them all at the same time, one four-year prison term. Yeah, which is pretty ridiculous so he actually makes parole in december of 1965 he's out of prison for a short period of time uh but then returned to prison after becoming involved in some type of fight this must have been a a violation of his parole so he's sent back to prison briefly and he is soon released after that well it's just so crazy how many times we hear about these killers that if they would have serve their full term that they wouldn't have been out of prison to commit this new crime. So that brings us up to 1966 when these three murders are committed. And like we said, arresting McDuff is a completely different situation than arresting Roy Green. They had to figure out one where McDuff would be. And because of his nature and what they knew about him already, and regardless of burying the gun near Roy Green's home or apartment, they were worried. Law enforcement was worried about McDuff being armed. And of course, he's considered to be very dangerous. So they wanted to kind of ambush him. And their first attempt at arresting McDuff was he had told Green and some other people that he had a date, which would have been Sunday, the day after the murders. So they try to ambush him when picking up his date. And I don't know if they arrived on the scene late. They, they may not have known all the, the, the details, the, the important stuff to, to kind of corner this guy. But they end up having to fire a a significant amount of bullets at McDuff and his vehicle. And it's only after they shoot out his tires and arrest him with guns drawn that he gives himself up. He's arrested and immediately he's saying, yeah, I'm innocent. I didn't have anything to do with with whatever that kid's talking about. Uh, Roy Green's a liar is his basic defense. Well, that's his whole thing. Deny, deny, deny. Don't ever admit that you know anything. Well, there's some problems with his defense, right? First of all, when you look at this, Roy Green, and this is something that it's it's tough to kind of convey to a jury and to people out there listening, but the sheriff and his investigators... A lot of times we've seen this, Captain, where somebody comes forward with some kind of confession or some kind of fantastical story, and 
they're able to see through it or they're able to start looking at evidence and timelines and things like that and start to say, hey, you know, not everything that this guy's saying lines up. In this situation, it all lines up. Roy Green's story, the timeline right. and the evidence and where he tells them they can find stuff, it all lines up. And the defense of McDuff saying, you know what? This kid, he's a liar. He asked to borrow my vehicle and he went out and did all this stuff himself on his own. The problem for that is what? So you, you gave your coworker your gun and your vehicle and he went out and committed these crimes by himself. You have a police record. You are known in town to be this rough hooligan and hoodlum and, and a bully. And then the evidence doesn't match up with McDuff's story, right? When you think about it, because because it's bullshit. We know that you had to have two people committing this crime, or at the very least, one person committing the crime who was in control enough that he was able to have one of the victims drive the car because we we're moving two vehicles at one time at during this timeline of these events that takes two people to do that. So right. that goes against McDuff and that's a uh, score one for Roy green, but also remember they stopped off at that gas station on the way home. This is about halfway roughly between where the murders were committed and where Roy green lives. And one thing that they were able to figure out Again, they have all of Roy Green's story here. They go to that gas station, and two things happen there. They find little chocolate One, donuts. they find two pieces of clothing that are discarded that, that have blood on them. And these are two pairs of men's underwear. So either Roy Green did this by himself, and he was wearing two pair of underwear and, and disposes of them at, in a trash can at this gas station. Or he had a, he had somebody with him and he says McDuff is the guy that was with him. And then on top of that, McDuff is not, he's not somebody that you're going to easily mistake him for somebody else. He's a pretty distinctive looking, looking person, right? He's six foot four. He's tall. He's got a nose, like a beak. He's got jet black hair. He's somebody that would be easily picked out of a crowd. And you have the gas station attendant, the person working there that night that says, yeah, it was two of them that stopped here, a tall guy and a young guy. Yeah. And McDuff's your guy. So Got him. all of these things fall in favor of Roy Green telling the truth and not that of Kenneth McDuff telling the truth. This is going to bring us up to the trial that begins in November of 1966. One thing that is incredibly strange here to me in this cat, in this story here, captain, you know, you find these little details that are just, they're haunting and they're bizarre, but the murders again, if in fact, this was the first murders that Kenneth McDuff was a part of. And again, by his own words to Roy green, this, these were not the first time, that he had committed such terrible acts, but this crime, these triple, this triple homicide was committed August 6th, 1966. This is literally just days after the, the Texas tower shooting. Yeah. Charles Whitman, August 1st, 1966 is when Charles Whitman, age 25 climbed up that tower in Austin, Texas, and open fire on the people down below. And then you have five days later, this incredibly horrific triple homicide that takes place near the Fort Worth, Texas area. And so because of all this stuff is news, Whitman was, was dead after the events that took place in Austin. McDuff is alive and going to go to trial. And the guy that helped him commit these murders says, this guy's a monster. He's, he's pure evil. And the local law enforcement's agreeing with them. And of course the victim's family are saying all the same things. And so the reporters want to know what somebody like Kenneth McDuff would 
think of the Texas Tower shootings and Charles Whitman. And he he goes, that guy must have been disturbed. He must have been crazy. <laughs> it takes one to know one. Like you're not, right? Like you're not there. Yeah, and for anybody that wants to check out that case, we covered it, episode 229, Charles Whitman. And like the captain said, the trial started in November of 1966. So very quick, right? From the time of the murders to the arrest to the trial. It was August and now it's November and we are in a courtroom and we are going to try Kenneth McDuff for a triple homicide, also charging him with robbery, rape, and abduction. The two individuals, Roy Green and Kenneth McDuff, will be actually tried separately because, for obvious reasons, Roy Green is the state's star witness. He's not only the state's star witness, but he is the key to trying to put away this murderer, this monstrous murderer, McDuff. So much more to get into, to dive into tomorrow. Join us back here in the garage. Let us get back into your earballs. Until tomorrow. Be good, be kind, and don't litter.